Now we're turning to 1 Samuel, uh, please, and chapter 28, 25 rather. One Samuel 25 and 1, and Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in man whose possessions were in, Car in Carmel. And the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus shall ye say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. And now I have known that thou hast shearers, now thy sh shepherds were with us. We hurt them not, neither were there aught missing unto them all the while they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they'll show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son David. And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David, and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. And shall I then take my bread and my water in my flesh that I have killed for my shearers and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those sayings. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword, and they girded on every man his sword, and David also girded on his sword, and there went up after David about four hundred men, and two hundred abode by the stuff. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were, they were a wall unto us, both, both night and day, all the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household, for he's such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste, and took two hundred loaves, two bottles of wine, five sheep ready dressed, five measures of parched corn, hundred clusters of raisins, two hundred cakes of figs, and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me, behold, I come after you. And she told not her husband Nabal. And so it was so, and it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert of the hill. And behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. And David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I so much as spare one male of all that pertains to him. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell down on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be, and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. What a beautiful intercession this is. Let not, my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name, which means fool, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send, 
Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies, and they that seek evil to my Lord, be as nable. And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul, but the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God, and the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling as out of the middle of a sling. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord have done to my Lord, according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel, then this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, even that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord. God of Israel, which hath sent thee this day to meet me, and blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thy which hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood, and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, uh, surely there would not have been a meal left by the morning light that pertained to Nabal. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him, and said unto him, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice, and have accepted thy person. And Abigail came to Nabal. And behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was very merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. And it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. I would think that's a heart attack there that he had, or some kind of uh, uh, attack he had that really paralyzed him as far as his heart's concerned. It came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. So he has this attack, and then ten days later he dies. And when Nabal heard, David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. When the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they said unto her, saying, David hath sent us unto thee to take thee to him to wife. And she arose, bowed herself on her face to the earth, and said, Behold, let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hasted and arose, rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her. And she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. And David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they were also, both of them, his wives. That's all we read, and thank you for your patience in the lovely Word of God that we've read together. Now, for those of you listening by tape on audio and video, uh, last week we were dealing with guidance. And we were dealing with the fact that King David uh, called for a nephod from his friend Abathar and used the system of Urim and Thummim uh, to get guidance. That's how we see it in the passage. And that led us on to a fascinating study of Urim and Thummim in the Bible and other methods that God uses to guide people when they have decisions to make. And then, of course, we began to look at that which is banned in the Bible and that which you're not allowed to turn to in order to look for guidance. And we listed a lot of things that we'll not go over now. And for those of you listening, if you want to get that tape and have a look at it, we've gone into that in some detail. 
But we are particularly just at the start of this meeting just going to deal with something we didn't have time to deal with last week, namely the fact that King Saul, at the end of his life, called upon a medium in order to try to seek guidance about a battle that he was just about to go into. And I promise you that soon we shall get to the subject of Abigail, which you're probably watching in for just now or listening by tape for. But maybe these facts will help you as well if you have problems in this area of guidance. Uh, spiritists all over the world claim that because King Saul called upon a medium and the medium said that Samuel had come up and Samuel communed from the dead with King Saul, that it is quite biblical for believers or unbelievers to get in touch with mediums who get in touch they say, with the dead. In other words, they use this passage in 1 Samuel 28 is the chapter as a basis upon which to deal with the whole world of communicating with the dead. Now, various views have been given about what happened. You take, as I see it, the, the, the narrative in its natural setting, and as you read it straight, it seems very clear to me that the medium did see Samuel return from the dead. The plain meaning is only denied because many people sincerely believe that well, that there is such a possibility as anyone appearing after they have died. They deny that possibility that a spirit can come back after someone has died, the spirit of that person. Or you have others who refuse to believe that God would have allowed a medium to call up one of the saints. A woman who worshipped the devil, would she have the power to call up the spirit of a dead saint? So you can see that if you read the passage straight, it certainly seems very clear that that's what she did. But because people deny such a possibility or do not allow that God would allow a woman to do this, then for many, many Christians that causes problems in the passage. The Jewish church always believed that Samuel really appeared in the early days of the New Testament. They certainly did. You get famous Christians in the early days like, uh, like Justin Martyr and Augustine who believed that Samuel really appeared, his spirit appeared, and that this woman and Saul communed with him. Tertullian, Jerome, and Luther, and Calvin, and Matthew Henry, they said that a demon appeared to the woman impersonating Samuel. So you get a lot of Christians who line up behind Calvin and Luther, and uh, Tertullian, and Jerome, and so forth. And they say it's a demon impersonating Samuel. Now let's look at the story very simply. Saul is in a quandary, for the Philistines are gathering their armies to fight against Israel, and he doesn't know what to do. And Saul is no, now so far away from God that he has lost contact, of course, with God, and the Lord wouldn't speak to him, as we saw last week, either by Urim or Thummim or by uh, any dreams or any prayers that he would offer. The Lord refused to communicate with him at this time. God was silent. Heavens were his brath. No answer. And you know, a man who is loose from God and who has lost contact with God is a very sorry creature. And of course, there's no telling what he will do. 
Here is a man who can get no answer from God about what he ought to do in his life, so he decides that he will consult a medium and inquire of her. And the very same chapter tells us in the third verse that, of course, at the time Samuel had died, King Saul had banned all the witches and banned all the wizards and banned all the mediums out of Israel. So the Scriptures are very clear that King Saul banned them. At, they were banned at the time of the death of Samuel. And yet here is the man who banned these things, deciding to go and ask a medium if she could give him some advice about the future. And of course, it's very clear in Scripture that he had an awful bad conscience about what he was going to do, because he disguised himself. And he went with two men down to see this witch at Endor. And he asked the woman, he says, Now, would you bring up a familiar spirit? And she says, Well, King Saul has banned them. Any of this he has banned. And King Saul swears by the Lord that nothing will happen to her. By the Lord, he says, Nothing's going to happen to you if you call up a familiar spirit. Isn't it very sad that he swore by the Lord that the Lord, he said, would protect the woman if she dabbled with hell? What a confused state to be in. Almost as if he is guaranteeing heaven's security while he bids her knock at hell's door. A lot of people get mixed up in their theology, you know. And they have a bit of truth in them. And sometimes a bit of truth is dangerous when they don't know the whole truth. And yet, this man did know the whole truth. And yet, he, he throws it to the wind. I hope there's no one listening to me tonight who was brought up in a Christian home and taught Christian principles. And you're dabbling in the occult and dabbling in Satan's power and yet still quoting the Bible and still seeking to give God his place at the same time. It's a contradiction in terms. And he was very contradictory. Now, of course, she gives the impression that she can call anybody up. And he says, all right, he says, bring me up Samuel. And the startling thing in the story is that something totally different from the usual experience that this medium had happened. Samuel, spirit, appeared. And she cried out in terror with a loud voice. And it seems to me very clear that when she cries out with a loud voice, when she saw Samuel, the obvious point that's being made is that she wasn't expecting Samuel. Else why should she be so filled with terror and affrighted? The medium's complete lack of composure at the appearance of a real spirit, as distinct from the normal familiar spirit, is to me irrefutable demonstration that the real spirit of a deceased person does not appear at a mediumistic seance. Even though at a mediumistic seance they claim that the real spirits of dead ones appear. Notice the Scripture is very emphatic about that. She cries out. Let me say this very carefully. This, as I see it, is one instance of a spirit's return from the realm of the dead by special divine permission and power. And it was for the express purpose of giving a divine warning to anybody who would even think of dabbling in occultism. 
to discover the future. And of course, when the Spirit did appear, it pronounced a fierce judgment upon King Saul. You see, when you look at this whole problem of do the spirits of the dead come back into the world and can mediums call them up, it seems to me that God's final statement on whether or not there is a spirit communication through consulting with a medium is, is the word that is given in 1 Chronicles where it says, Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance and did not inquire of the Lord. God's epitaph in 1 Chronicles 10 upon Saul is a damning epitaph. Of course, in the New Testament, as well as in the Old Testament, there is very clear teaching as to whether or not it is permissible or possible to communicate with the dead. You will remember there was a man in hell who pleads with Abraham, etc., and pled with others that somebody would be sent back to earth to warn his family about the fearsome place in which he had turned up. And the answer was given to him irrevocably. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented, and beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. And if the persuasive, heartbreaking pleading of the rich man in hell, as Christ told it clearly, couldn't bring about the sending back of the spirit of Lazarus to the earth to warn his brothers, Neither can a medium under the influence of demoniac powers call upon the spirits of the dead to return. This one instance of it in Scripture cannot be isolated out and used as a context to say that this is what happens all the time. Notice the very chilling words. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, says the tormented rich man in hell. No, Father Abram, he says, if somebody came from the dead and went to them, they would repent. And you are maybe not a Christian here tonight, and you say, I'm skeptical of the whole existence of, of the world of heaven and hell, and skeptical of the Bible, and skeptical of the whole truth of the gospel. Well, my friend, you might say, let's see somebody out of hell, and they can maybe tell us what it's like, and then we'll repent. No, says the Word of God. If you don't listen to Moses and the prophets, first five books of the Bible and all the prophets in the Old Testament, and of course the New Testament prophets too, giving their prophecy in, a, in, a, in another sense, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. In other words, God refuses to allow guiding spirits to come back from the dead to guide us as to what we should do or whatever. God does not offer guiding spirits to men and women. And if you are dabbling in it, as I warned you last week, and let's not go over it all again, we went into it in depth. If you are dabbling in it and you say, but if only I could speak to my mother, if only I could speak to my brother that I lost or my father, it would make such a difference in life. My friend, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, God does not allow it. There is very clearly only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Of course, I believe when believers die, they are immediately absent from the body and present with the Lord. And what a wonderful place that is. 
Yet at the same time, we are not even, if we are believers, to seek to try and get in touch with them, because Scripture, as I see it, will not allow it. We are not allowed to go to mediums, and we give you the Scriptures on that. They are banned. We are not to touch it in any way. So involvement with the occult in all its various forms is not only self-destructive, it's dishonoring to God and its rank disobedience. I think perhaps Peter Anderson has really summed it all up for me personally best when he wrote these words. Now, listen carefully. Not that you're not listening, but listen carefully to what he said. He said, All spirit communication is not with the spirits of the departed dead, but rather with demons who impersonate the, depart the departed for their own ends. And I have no doubt that mediums, when they are uh, getting into their seances, are in touch with demons. We saw Kenny Everett last week in his testimony as to the seance that he went to and what he heard and how he warned everybody to stay away from seances. And the man is certainly not a believer by any means, warning people to stay away from it. And uh, there is no doubt about it. It seems to me that demons are at work in these seances because they can uh, tell uh, on Ouija boards and all the rest of it and the glass moving and, and all this spelling out where people have died and where accidents have occurred and, and things in the future. I have no doubt that these people are in contact with demons. But I do not think that those people that they are, those demons they are in contact with are in fact the departed dead, but impersonations of the departed dead. So don't listen to that nonsense. And just take this one occurrence in Scripture as it occurs very clearly, where God condemns them for doing it, and God allows Samuel to come back in order to warn King Saul and to pronounce judgment on him. It is not a basis for us to dabble in it, because the rest of Scripture very clearly stands against us entering into it. It's a very complex subject, but I hope that that will help you and that you'll stay away from it in all forms and that God will give you grace to look to Him alone for guidance in all that you do for Him in these days. Now we turn to this fascinating episode in 1 Samuel chapter 25. And let me tell you that just as God's mercies are new to you every morning, so are Satan's devices new every morning. Maybe some of you have discovered that today already since you got up. Yes, God's mercies are new every morning. But Satan is a dirty fighter, and his devices are new every morning. The thing he used yesterday to try and trip you may not necessarily be the thing he will use today. And David is still on the run from Saul. And he's given here at this time protection to the sheep masters in this area of the wilderness of Paran in the extreme south of Judah. And his men have protected these fellows as a sheep shearing time from marauders and robbers. And in fact, they later said that David and his men were like a wall to them at this sheep shearing time, protecting them from their enemies. And David's advent after the death of Samuel, when he moved away from Saul, notice in the opening verses how that Saul and Samuel are together at the, it seems to me, at the, very clearly, at the death, the funeral of Samuel in the opening verses. Verse 1, Samuel died, 25 and 1. All Israel are gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. Of course, that's the way it is in Ulster too. People who fight and argue and have political differences and religious differences, they drop them whenever there's a funeral. And it's all cups of tea and buns and will you sit here and hello and how are you? And my goodness, you're plied with sandwiches and People who would shoot you dead are holding out hands to you and, and uh, all that. Why is there all this peace? Because there's a dead body there. And sometimes I think, almost as a preacher, the best way to get the church united in Ulster would be to take a dead body with you everywhere, and people would all unite. 
for they won't go to each other's churches, and they won't even listen sometimes to uh, people who are born again, and because they don't agree with them, one born again person with another, and uh, oh no, I wouldn't go there, but let somebody die, and they're there about a hundred. In other words, they get together when somebody's dead, and I'm not being sarcastic, I'm stating the truth. Isn't it a sad state of affairs that very often, sometimes even Christians who are divided by such small things will unite whenever there's a death, and they're all nice to each other. But as soon as the death's over, they're back into their trenches again. Exactly here. All Israel is gathered. Saul is there. David is there. All the divisions forgotten. They're burying this great prophet. But as soon as the funeral's over, wham, they're all back into their trenches. And instead of Saul saying, for dear sakes, David, I'll forget my jealousy and I'll put away all the silly things I've been doing and I'll take you back to the palace and the Lord is going to make you king one day and I'm content about that. Not on your life. He starts to chase him as soon as the funeral's over. Samuel's hardly in his grave. His body's hardly in his grave to these fellows. Poor David has to clear out. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. What a sad situation. And I hope it will not take that to unite us. And I trust that when there is a death, it will level us and that we will be careful to show each other the same amount of respect and love that we do at funerals on other days as well. Here we have this situation of David being chased and then protecting all these sheep shearers and these sheep masters in this area. Now, the biggest one in the area was a fellow called Nabal. And he had a lot of sheep, and the Bible tells us how much he had and how much uh, greatness he had in wealth, 3,000 sheep, 1,000 goats, verse 2. And he has all this, and he's a very wealthy man. And David's looking after his shepherds, although he is not there personally, it seems. And I suppose it's the same kind of system, folks, as when you tip a waitress or a waiter or whatever. I remember the first time I was in New York City, and I drove in a yellow taxi cab, and I thought they were all as friendly as Ulster ones. And I got in, and I went along Fifth Avenue and around some corners or whatever. And I got out, and I said to the man, I paid him, and I said to him, uh, I said, that's the first time I've ever ridden in a New York taxi cab. And I thought that would be a historic moment, you know, for me or whatever. I just was trying to be friendly. I said, that's the first time I've ever driven uh, or sat in one of these. Well, he said, we usually got a tip of 40 cents, sir which was kind of nasty, wasn't it? I don't know, I forget whether I give it to him or not. In other words, he was going to set me right before very long. Well, I, the fellows who did this and protected shepherds from marauders were usually tipped. That is a practice. The sheep masters would usually give them some money for protecting their flocks. And David sent ten of his young men down to where Nabal was on his ranch, if you like, in the big house. And they come and they say, now, you know, um, we've been looking after your sheep and you haven't lost anything that has pertained to you. All of these time of sheep shearing and so forth. And, uh, you know, could you give David and his men, 600 of them, you know, we've been trying to help you. Could you give us anything that lies to your hand? Well, you know, food or whatever. And it led to very dismissive language. And that dismissive language got David on the boil, and it got David on the boil. It led to an incident which presents to us one of the loveliest women in all of Scripture. Now, notice that the story centers on three characters. The first one is Nabal. first one is Nabal. Scripture paints him very graphically. He's one of those miserable, overbearing men as far as his inferiors are concerned. Anybody's inferior to him, he's absolutely overbearing. wonder are you an overbearing person? It's a horrible thing to be overbearing. And of course, when he made a lot of money and he was in prosperity, he was intolerable. And some people are like that. When they get a bit of success, it blows their heads and blows their lives, and you couldn't live with them. They are intolerable. And then whenever things fell apart, he was absolutely abject in his misfortune. 
He flouted and he sneered everybody when he thought he was secure. And whenever things went against him, his heart cringed when there was a reversal in his circumstances. You know people like that? Unbearable when they're doing well and just absolutely hopeless when things go against them. One of his servants described him with these words. He's such a son of Belial that you couldn't talk to him. Belial means good for nothing. He's a vain fellow. Notice that the scripture in the authorized version calls him very great. He was very great, but of course it was the meanest kind of greatness that any man could have. You know, there are four kinds of greatness. The meanest kind of greatness is just to be great in what you possess. To have a whole lot of possessions, and that's the only thing about you that's great. You have many possessions. You were great in your possessions. That's mean. If that's all you have, friend, God help you. Then a second kind of greatness, a much better greatness, is to be able to conceive and convey great thoughts. An even better greatness than that, a third kind of greatness, is to be able to practice those good thoughts and great thoughts and, and, and be great in your doing rather than just in your thinking. But the fourth kind of greatness is the best kind of greatness of all. It is to be great in character. I wonder what kind of a character you are tonight, and I wonder what kind of a character I am. I tell you, young people, particularly tonight, you will learn this. Older people will have known it already. One day you will meet in your life a truly great man who couldn't care two hoots about money or fame. And then you will know how truly poor you are. And that applies to me too. There is something in this world that is unnerving to the vast majority of people. It is somebody whom money and fame don't really matter to. Don't matter to at all. And then when you have met that kind of person who is neither moved by fame nor moved by money, as far as their character is concerned, you've met a truly great person. He was a fool, that's what his name means, and his wife said, as his name is, so is he. He was rude, he was uncourteous, he was uncivil, and his wife was a very sweet woman, and she just couldn't have said such a thing about him, it seems to me, without those rude hands of his having wantonly broken down the very last remnant of wifely respect and love that she had. He broke it down with his crudeness and his rudeness and his uncourteous behavior until his wife had to say to David, he's a fool. I hope, sir, your wife will never have to say that of you. She who loved you and married you and respected you and looked up to you and followed you, but because of your behavior, she has come to believe you to be a fool. You, sir, are a poor man. If a good wife has to say about you that you're a fool, to hold a wife's love and respect isn't done in a day or a date or in a night or in some great holiday or in loads of money or buying a fabulous car. That's not what holds a good wife's true respect. If you would hold your wife's respect, sir, you must be good. You must be good. Not famous, but good. If you are famous and good, that's great. Good. I spoke at a conference many years ago with Ron McMillan, once the pastor of the Templemore Hall, Assembly, and now the Secretary of the Keswick Convention. And after I'd preached on a passage, I can hear that Scotsman pray yet. It still rings in my head, Lord, 
We don't want to be famous men. We want to be good men. Character. It's worth more than gold. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor than silver or gold. If you have a wife's loving favor, sir, it is better to you than all the silver and gold you can find. You're a rich man. I wonder why it is. Why is it that such lovely women end up with such miserable men at times? Why is it that so often the abigails of this world get married to the nibbles of this world? You know, there are appetites and longings in your soul that good dinners won't satisfy, or materialism can't fill. There are cravings within your heart and soul which won't be appeased merely because you have three meals a day or live in a lovely home. And this man seems to me to have had no clue whatsoever about how to fulfill that in his life or his wife's life. I wonder, am I talking tonight to a sexual slob? And is he sitting listening to me? Let's talk straight. And your wife is disgusted with you I wonder, is there some fella here tonight, and that's what you've turned into, and you're not even married yet? And that girl thought so much of you, but she thinks virtually nothing now. You are so crude. Your language is so filled with innuendo. And you have given your heart and spirit to the flesh. That's the way it is around us. I watch those young fellas pour out of those pubs around the Crescent at nights when I go home. And my heart is sore when I see the slobs that they are, even urinating all around this church on the public streets. I never thought I would see it in this city in broad daylight as I did with a crowd of young fellas just a few yards from this place with women walking by in the street. That's what drink does. I've got mine, whines the song. Have you got yours? And they fill themselves up with lager or booze or whatever until our streets are filled around here with slobs. Let's be honest. Has chivalry left? What on earth has happened to our generation? Even kids on the street. I was going along a street tonight on the way to the meeting, and there's a, there's a teenager in front of me on a skateboard right in the middle of the road. And I sort of said as I came along, uh, excuse me, and he gave me a very interesting comment. I don't know who he was, but he was some mother's burn. There is a cheekiness, there is a, there is a licentiousness, there is a filth in language, there is a lack of fear of God, there is a carelessness brought on by giving people to, young fellas giving themselves to booze and drink, and girls, unfortunately, by the hundred around us here at night, queuing up for the same thing. I wonder, are there neighbors here? uncourteous, uncivil, rude, losing even the very basic rudiments of civilization and civilized behavior. Terrible, isn't it? And of course, whenever David sent his, his men along, and these men come along to speak to Nabal, 
and say, we have looked after and helped your people and so forth? What does he say? I'll tell you what he says. He accuses David of raising a revolt against his master. He accuses David and his men of being idle men and vain men. Absolutely incredible, isn't it? He was so stupid. He had no idea of the circumstances that had driven young David into the wilderness. And I'm afraid there are some believers even behave like that. And they go for young people or older people without thinking about the circumstances that have driven them into that situation. Here is David, absolutely cut off from home and family and everything, on the run from a man who's trying to kill him. And this man is so thick, he can't even see or realize the circumstances that have driven David into this sad, lonely corner. My friend, notice that he had no idea of the consequences of what he said. It just tripped out of him. He was such a fool. Ah, lots of guys are leaving their masters nowadays. Ah, you know, why should I give my food to those men that I don't know? And he never even thought about the consequences of what he said. He went home, the Bible says, and he had a feast like a king. And he filled himself up with wine, and his heart was merry, the slob that he was. I think that sometimes we too have no idea of the consequences of the hurtful things we do and the construction that we put upon circumstances as we find them. We have no idea of the heartbreak we leave behind us. He had no idea that David, he was striking at the very heart of David because David was out there in the will of God. I was preaching in a place a while back, finished preaching over the hills and far away, not in this land. And after I'd finished preaching, I'm standing at the door, you know, and I'm shaking hands with all these people going out. And here's a young fella standing who had taken part in a meeting, and here's an older fella, and he's talking to him. And as I looked at him, I thought, that older man has turned into that young fella. He's hurting him. So I never said anything and until the evening service came and then the young fellow whom I happened to have had experience in helping years ago through a message preached and he sat down and he started to tell me about his circumstances and then eventually out it came that he was getting it rough in this particular church. I said, I know. He said, how do you know? Well, I said, I saw it in your eyes this morning, brother. His big eyes filled up with tears. I said, that fellow was giving off to you, wasn't he? He says, yeah. And I wonder, is there just a young man listening to me now, and I'm just sent here to help you tonight? I wonder, fellow, have you lived for the Lord, and you've put the Lord first, and you've gone for God, and you've really sought to put God right in your business, and your home, and your plans, and, and what's happened? Everything's gone wrong. And you're out there in the wilderness of Paran, if you like, and you don't know what to do, and you don't know where to turn, and you try to help people, and the more you help them, they say, ah, you're loose from your master, or loose from your job, or this, or that, or the other. And you're hurt. And you sitting here tonight, fella, hurting. There's some girl listening to me tonight in this place, and you are hurting, really hurting, because somebody has put a miserable construction on what is genuinely the will of God for you. I've experienced it. I know what it's like when you do the will of God and you seek to do it as best you know, and others don't understand and put their own construction on it. And of course, he just raised the passion in David. David had had enough. There's no fellow up until this time had shown more self-restraint. He could have killed Saul twice, but he didn't. 
And he had held back, and he had held back, and he had held back from, from rushing ahead of God at this time in his life. And he went to the prophets, and he went to the priests to ask for guidance. But now this fellow just says these miserable things to him. And he says, I've had enough. Give me my sword. Right, fellas, get your swords on. And before the morning light comes, there'll not be a meal left pertaining to that household or his servants or whatever. We're going to kill a lot. You see, yesterday's victories become today's temptations. The thing that you would have shunned yesterday, maybe you embraced this morning. You can't live today on yesterday's obedience. And he'd been very obedient and very good, trusting God all of these months. But just that wicked construction on a hurting young man who was seeking to do the will of God that was costing him everything. And he thought, I've had enough. I'm sick of it all. Let's kill them. Passion took him over. Anger. Anger and passion are not the hand made of self-control. Passion isn't the hand made of self-control. Passion is leading David to the brink of crime and murder. And of course, all the while, he thinks it's perfectly justified. This man showed me evil for good. It's intolerable. I've got to show that I, I have self-respect. I've got to stand up and, and show that I am God's man and that the Lord has put me here. And he did. And I've got to show this man who I am and I'm God's man and I'm God's person in, in this place and so on. Are you feeling like that and you're sick of them and what they're saying about you and all the criticism they're throwing at you, my friend, and you are ready to do something stupid and something silly, and in your calmer, quieter moments, you'll be sorry if you do what you're thinking of doing. It'll be a grief to you. It'll haunt your heart for years. He was going to shed blood causelessly and avenge himself, and instead of leaving it to the Lord to sling out the souls of his enemies as a stone out of a sling, he says, I'm going to take it in my own hands. And it's almost like a Western movie. Here they are, the 400 of them, leaving 200 at home or at the cave where they were. And they're coming around the covert of the hill, almost like a movie set, only it's true, it's not a fantasy. Bent on murder. The sweet psalmist of Israel. The fellow who had such a beautiful complexion, a ruddy complexion, the Bible says, the gifted musician, the military strategist, the giant killer of the Valley of Elah, the greatest writer of Psalms in all the history of the world, now and will ever be. And he says, I'm going to get that guy because he says that I'm just idle. I'm going to kill that guy because he says that I am this, that, and the other. And suddenly, as he comes round the cover of the hill, there lying on the ground in front of him, when she sees him with her head to the ground, is one of the most beautiful women he ever looked at. Beautiful women have an effect on fellas, you know. If you don't think that, well, you'd better think it soon. Because they do. This beautiful woman moved him. But she didn't just move him because she was beautiful. The Bible says she had this lovely countenance, but she also had good understanding. And I know there's maybe some girl sitting watching me tonight or listening to me on tape, and you say, yes, Derek, she, she was okay. She was a beautiful woman. She had this lovely countenance. But I'm not really all that beautiful. Well, I know I'm no Vogue color either, friend, so uh, you and I are in the same corner, but... Um, let me tell you this much. Although we may not be a Vogue cover, let me tell you that the Bible says distinctly, girls, that as far as God is concerned, you can be beautiful without being good-looking. You say, tell me more. Well, it's true, is it not? It's true. 
It's true. There are some people in this world who are very beautiful women, but they are desperately lacking in good understanding. Good understanding is something that is moral, you know, rather than intellectual. And it puts a glow of beauty even on the very plainest face and the very plainest features. Good understanding can put a glow of beauty into any girl's life, whoever she is. And anyway, youth and beauty pass away. They pass away. And the plain fact of the powerful Scripture is that if you have that lovely, meek and quiet spirit which the Lord gives to those women who trust Him, that inner spirit that can stand both now and uncritically accept the various phases of life that you will go through gracefully and go forward with that quiet spirit that the Lord can give you and that good understanding that you have of life through knowing Christ, you can live a very beautiful life. When many of this world's great beauties, like the Marilyn Monroe's of this life, who said, I'm the kind of girl you find in a back corridor with a bottle of barbiturates in her hand at, what, 36? One of the most beautiful women in the world, the sex goddess of the nuclear age, could have had any man she wanted and anything she wanted. Why is she lying dead? Why does she take her life? Was it not Helena Rubinstein who said that she was, when she was facing death, she was going out and she had no preparation made? You can be beautiful without having physical beauty, and that lasts longer. Here in this lovely girl, beauty and brains combined, and it was a beautiful combination. But again I say, how do Abigails end up getting married to Nabal's? God-fearing, high-minded, tender, sensitive women, getting tied up in an indissoluble union with men that they have no true affinity with. Hey, girls, would you take a word from me tonight? And I've been praying about this. I mean it lovingly. And not in any arrogant way, you know, sort of pointing at you or whatever, but could you take an advice from an old bull-headed preacher? Huh? Don't be compelled by your circumstances to marry someone. Don't be compelled by flattery to marry someone. Don't be compelled by deceitful tongues to marry someone. Don't let the urgency of your friends push you into it if you don't love that person and that person doesn't love the Lord. Don't let them shove you in or you will end up in Abigail's pitiful plight. Notice that the teaching of Scripture is very clear that Abigail, once she's married to this man and in this circumstance, and to be fair to her, maybe it was Eastern custom and she was forced to marry this man. Let's be fair, but let's say this much, that to such an Abigail, the clear teaching of Scripture is that you must stay where you are if you are married to a nibble. And maybe you are. The fact that you have a dissimilar temperament or dissimilar tastes to the one to whom you are now married does not constitute a sufficient reason for you to leave him. Although, mind you, I must say this, and it's a personal view. If you are experiencing physical abuse in your marriage and you're being beat up night after night by your husband, I don't think that you have to stay in that house with him night after night and let him use the fact that you are a Christian uh, and, uh, and use that uh, as an excuse to keep beating you up. 
I certainly wouldn't say it against the law if you got a court order to ban him from coming into that house to beat you up. I don't think the Scripture teaches that you have to take physical violence night after night because you're a Christian. And I have talked to quite a few women in this place who have come to this Bible study over the years from wherever, who have suffered a lot of violence, and who have got court orders to save them from being virtually killed. But although that court order is there to preserve you from being beaten up, I d there is a difference here. If it is a difference merely in temperament and a difference in, in taste, that is not enough. That is not enough to have a separation or a divorce. Don't let his behavior push you into losing your dignity. Don't let your purer nature be besmotted or bespotted or smeared by his behavior. Notice this lovely woman. She stayed with him, fool and all as he was. Obviously, he hadn't been beating her up or whatever, but here she is in this situation, and there she is standing by God's grace, keeping her soul clean and pure by God's grace and trying to be a good influence on him. She didn't leave him. She stayed. And I advise you to do the same. I remember once in a mission I had in Liverpool, a lady got saved one night, and she came back to me two or three nights later, and she says, do you think I should leave my husband now I've become a Christian? Because <laughs> he doesn't like it that I've become a Christian. Do you think I should leave him? When I showed her 1 Corinthians 7, that she should not, and if he'd be willing to stay, even though she were a believer, she was to stay with him. She thought she would just get up and get out because he didn't like it. No, no. But let me warn you, girls, if you marry for a lovely house, or you marry for a few acres of land, or you marry for a good position, and that's the only thing you marry for, irrespective of the character of the one you are marrying or love for the one you are marrying, it can only end in one way, absolute disaster. You won't raise him to your level, you'll sink to his. To marry not for love, to marry in the unequal yoke, and to go against your Lord's wishes is to profane the idea of God's marriage. But if you have disobeyed and you have gone ahead and that's where you are, stay, Christian. And who can tell what a sanctified wife will have, the influence they will have upon their husband. He may well get saved. So these two weren't peas in a pod, were they? They differed vastly. Now David's ripping mad. What do you feed an angry man? I wonder how you ladies would feed an angry man. You say, I know how I would handle him. Well, might be interesting. <laughs> I went into a car park in Belfast recently, and there was a man there, and he was talking about this woman, and, and she'd been a terrible driver, and she had bashed up a Porsche, and she put a big hunk in the middle of it, and she called her husband up, and he was a doctor, I think he came down, and, and he described that poor fellow arriving to see his wrecked Porsche, and she wrecked it in a car park <laughs> at about five miles an hour. Said it was very interesting. And he told me about another lady that a friend of his was teaching to drive up the M1. And he said to the lady, let your clutch out. And she opened the door. <laughs> well, maybe that would get him mad. But believe me, this wasn't a joke. This fellow was very angry. And maybe you men say, I know what I would do with a woman if she made some mistakes, but what does a woman do with a man who is angry, who is God's man? Well, she emptied the larder, first of all. Two hundred loaves, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, thirty-seven liters of roasted corn, hundred cakes of raisins, two hundred cakes of pressed figs. She gets them on the back of these donkeys, takes them down, and as David and his men come round the covert of the hill, she gets down before David. And I love this. 
What an interview. It's a credit to a woman's wit and to her grace of heart and to her godliness. She bows at David's feet. She has a very frank confession about her husband's wrong. She says, my husband was wrong. She expresses thankfulness that so far David has been kept from killing anybody and blood guiltlessness is in his life now, but he was very nearly being blood guilty and avenging his own wrongs. She depreciates all this food that she's brought from his men. I can almost see these poor guys starving, standing, saying, oh, David, would you get on with it? And let's, let's have this, all this food, poor fellas. She knew the best way to a man's heart was through his stomach. At least as far as his men were concerned, she was practical. They were hungry. But far more than that, she depreciates the generous gift she's brought as only fit. Your servants are, are fit for this. They deserve it. But then notice how I love her spirituality. She says, David, David, I know that you love to fight the Lord's battles. You're famous for that. You've always been famous for that, David. And you have an unblemished name in that area for fighting the Lord's battles. And, 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 and David, I just want to tell you that in coming days, God is going to make you king. She reminded him of the promises of God. Didn't God promise to make you king, David? And, and David, I know, I know, David, that the Lord will sling your enemies out of your life like a stone out of a sling. Boy, did she know how to communicate with that fellow because with a sling and a stone he had brought down the giant. The Lord will do that with your enemies, David. And David, you don't want any shadow in your sunlight when you become king and any experience haunting your life, fellow, and with a haunting memory in coming days. Don't kill my husband. Don't kill his servants. He's a fool. I know he's a fool. Just leave him to the Lord. Just let the Lord handle him. And now there's all this argument about a woman's ministry. <laughs> and should a woman do this and should a woman do that and should a woman do the other thing and the Church of England going to split over it or ostensibly and oh I've heard more hot air on the subject than enough ministry of a woman <laughs> if you any idea girls of the power of femininity in the hand of God to influence men for God especially men like David. Of all the prophets and all the preachers and all the great believers and all the wonderful people that were in Israel, there was only one Abigail. All I can say is that if it hadn't been for the ministry of godly women in my life down through the years, I, I wouldn't be up here. I can think of some of them who have come across my path, mothers in Israel especially, and said, Derek, 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 you don't need that. You don't need that. You don't need to go into that and follow that. Just stick to the word. <laughs> oh, I think of a godly woman who belonged to this assembly, you know, and I thought I'd have a wee break from preaching the word on a Tuesday night and detailed Bible preaching. I'd do a bit of church history. That would be interesting. And people would be interested in church history and some of these wonderful stories of faith. And I remember getting up and talking about Luther, and there were hundreds here. And I remember talking about other people, and everybody was sitting shifting in the seat from hip to hip. You know a crowd, when they're uneasy, they go from hip to hip, especially in the crescent with those awful sore seats under you there. <laughs> from hip to hip. And I couldn't hold them. There was no power in the meetings. There was no grip. It was no good. And I remember coming home and this godly young lady was sitting in our home and I remember saying to her, I said to her, you know, I said, Hazel, and she's a missionary in France now and her husband Gordon was there. I said, tell me, Hazel, I said, uh, what's wrong with my preaching? She never said a word about my preaching. Although she felt a whole lot. 
She never said a word, and she came in from the meeting, and I, she happened to be there, and I, I said to her, hey, what's wrong, Hazel? There's something wrong in those meetings. Will you tell me what, where, what? She said, Derek, when you get back to the Word, you'll be okay. I crawled to bed. <laughs> and I remember another godly woman who came to this Bible class from the Iron Hall, and I remember her so well, and she was sitting in the meetings, and she told me, she said, you know, I went out of the meeting that night, and she said, when Derek goes back to the Word, I'll go back to the meetings. But these women didn't tear me apart. They just stood in my way and said, come on, fella, this is the thing that has the power. Godly woman, just a wee word like that to a fella like me can direct me, you know. Is there some young man here and you're trying to serve the Lord and your young wife is with you and she thinks you're out too often serving the Lord and she's been very sarcastic like Michael was with David and said, oh, you got far too excited carrying that ark today, David. And you've discouraged your husband. Ah, put your arms around him and thank God that he's out serving the Lord at nights with a word and praise God that he's not sitting in the pub like hundreds around me tonight. And encourage him. And say to your wee children, see your dad, see the way he's living, following his steps. Oh, girls, my mum used to say, a church is only as good as its women will let it be. I mean, I've been preaching since I was 12, and as you would know, looking at me, that's been a long time. I've been preaching since I was 12, virtually every week of my life in some pulpit somewhere, testimonies as a child and then further on, you know. And I'm long enough in the tooth to know that my mother was right. Women have an incredible influence on the spirituality of a church, an incredible influence on the leaders of the church. No matter how a man may want to lead, if his wife doesn't let him lead, it can have disastrous effects upon the spirituality of the church. Hey, girls, look at Abigail. Look at her. She didn't need to empty her larder. She said, ah, that stupid fool, David, if he's going to get mad and angry. What do I care about him? Sure, anyway, he's, he's just a young whippersnapper snapped up from the, from the plains of Bethlehem or whatever, or the hills of Bethlehem. What do I care? What, what has it to do with me if he wants to kill my husband? Sure, he's a fool, anyway. Sure, it's nothing to do with me. And she got a sat at home and munched her toast and got her loaves of bread and her raisins and said, see if I care. You know, a whole lot of women like that, you don't care whether a young fella goes on for God or not. It doesn't really worry them. They're more interested in Dallas or neighbors. What do I care whether he got the doctrine right or wrong? Sure, he's only young anyway. Instead of being like an Aquila and Priscilla, and taking the young orator from North Africa, Apollos, and instructing him in the way more perfectly. Calvary was missing from his preaching, and that pair, I almost see them, that take him almost, seems to me, home for tea, and they say, Paulus, that was great preaching in the synagogue today. And you're, you're a convert of John the Baptist. Have, have you heard about Calvary, Apollos? Hey, Apollos, have you seen these great truths? And before they knew where they were, Apollos had become the one who was the most refreshing character in the churches of the New Testament at that time. I plant, says Paul, Apollos waters. Where did all that lovely refreshment come from in that young fellow's ministry? A godly woman in her home and her husband encouraging him. Oh, girls, I say to you tonight, look at the ministry that lies to your hand. There are young Davids rising all around you. And of course, she never said anything to her husband when she went home about what she'd done because he was drunk, very drunk, says the Bible. And in the morning... She told him, notice that she was honorable. She told him what had happened. And whether it was sheer panic at what she had done or whatever, he has this heart attack. And then eventually, the Lord cuts him down and takes his life away. Wasn't David glad that he hadn't done it? 
And of course, it seems to me that yesterday's victories don't have to become today's defeats. Do they? And David sends his men and they propose, or David proposes to her, and very humbly and gently she acquiesces to his request and becomes his wife. In my humble opinion, Abigail was the greatest woman in David's life, and one of the greatest women in all biblical history. Why? Because she seized an opportunity to guide a young man away from his own anger to the Lord and to get his heart on the things of God. And she saved his life and saved his testimony. You could do that. And hey, girls, if you only did it to one fella and he became a David in your generation, wouldn't your life have been worth living? Don't ever tell me you don't have a ministry. Of course you have a far greater ministry than you've ever dreamt of. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you that all of your idols, they, they end, whether in this life or the next, happily. Thank you for this lovely story. And bless it to our lives. And the people of God said,